This is a production of Cornell University. Well, thank you, especially to Jean-Luc for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to see all the exciting work that you're doing. Uh, so this is, a, again, work that I did uh, during my postdoc with Ben McCloskey. Some of you may or may not know him. He was in nature source genetics. And like me, he's an operations research person, so essentially an applied mathematician at some level. Uh, he was a deterministic optimizer, graduated, I believe, out of Rice and a postdoc at Columbia before he was hired in to help with the optimization routines inside nature source genetics. And so we actually, interestingly, met at a conference. Uh, the big conference for our area is called INFORMS, the Institute for Operations Research and Management Science. And we started talking and he had plant problems that were relevant to the kind of solution techniques that I was working on. And then we discovered we're both in Cornell, so we might as well collaborate. And so we did. Uh, so this talk is a little bit difficult to give. This is only the second time that I've given it to people who know more about plants than about operations research. So it is a little mathy in places uh, because I'm used to giving this to an operations research audience. But I would rather you ask questions and interrupt me and I'll skip some slides if you get totally lost. There's a, a chalkboard here. Um, so I want you to, to take away something from the talk rather than hear myself talk if you get too lost. So I'd rather this be informal. Uh, this is quite formal room, but it's not too different than the one I teach probability in. So um, raise your hand. I'll try to repeat the question. I think we might have some people online and we have a chalkboard, so we can go at whatever pace is comfortable for you. Um, so I have prepared two tutorials. One is aimed at plant breeding people to say, what is simulation optimization in the first place? So that's the, the first little bit of the talk. The second tutorial is a tutorial on some mathematics that you may find unfamiliar that I give to everyone, including operations research people. And then we'll get into the plant breeding part. So we'll kind of have two little prefaces, and then we'll go back into the main problem that we're going to talk about. OK. So for now, I'm going to assume that you have heard at some level of optimization. And so what do we mean by optimization? Um, this is a farm management example at the plant breeding conference. Um, Bill Beavis went before me, and this was his example, and I stole it because it was amazing. Uh, so he's not here to, to explain it to you, but essentially you want to maximize profit and you have some decisions that you can make on your farm, right? So you can decide uh, how many acres of wheat, corn, and beans. I'm going to have to use this for a pointer. Uh, so in this notation, the X is the decision vector. So the X's are things you can decide. So how much wheat, corn, and beans you can plant, uh, how much you sell, what price you, how many beans you sell at a lower price and how much you purchase and so on. And then you can formulate this. We have a linear objective. So the profit function is just a linear combination of the decisions that you make. And you have some constraints. So for example, the constraints might be that you can't plant more wheat, corn, and beans than you have acres. If you only have 500 acres, then that's all you can do. So this is a classic uh, farm management type problem. In fact, many linear optimization methods were developed to solve these kinds of problems, and they're very old. And so, so they're easy to solve. We can solve them. They're deterministic, so to speak. So the profit model is linear. We have no uncertainty whatsoever. And this may be a good model for your farm. It may be that you've been making decisions with this model and everything is going great. And so this model is a of sufficient granularity for your choices. You don't need anything else. But it may be that this model is failing you for some reason. And maybe what you plant is not what you yield in the end. Uh, maybe the price that you thought you could get is fluctuating a lot in a random way. And so this model may not work anymore. You may need to incorporate a different model with randomness. And so you can formulate profit. Right now, my profit will become random. It's a random function of these things that I don't know. I don't know my yield, what it's going to be. I don't know what my prices are going to be. 
And so the only thing I can do is try to maximize my expected profit. So that means that in any one year, I don't know how I'm going to do, but I want to do well on average across many years. Right? So I have to deal with this uncertainty in the yield and price, and I formulate a profit function. It's still a function of all my decision variables and the random yield and the random price now, and I want to maximize the expected profit. Okay, so now I've turned what was a linear model into something that is stochastic at some level. So the ultimate goal is to maximize this expected profit. And I still have my constraints on my decision variables. Sometimes that profit function gets so complicated that we don't have any closed form for it. So you can have stochastic optimization problems. Before, this could still be a linear function, and I have random variables in that linear function. That's possible. But sometimes, maybe you have a really complicated uh, climate model that's going to tell you your yield. And maybe you have really complicated market model from some finance people that's going to tell you about your prices. And so now this thing gets extremely complicated. It's maybe a high fidelity model. It takes a long time to run it. And so you embed the whole function inside a computer. And so you have essentially a Monte Carlo simulation where you decide some decision variables. Those are your x's. You decide what they are. And you query the simulation model. And you say, OK, if I decide these decision variables to be at these values, what will my price be, or what will my profit be in the first year? Do it again, same decision variables. What will my profit be in the second year? Same thing again, third year, so on. And then you're trying to construct an estimator, right? Construct an estimator of your expected profit as a function of this uncertainty, where all of your function is essentially living inside of a black box, and you can only observe it with noise. So it's it's corrupted by noise, so to, speak, so to speak. And I've collapsed the uh, constraints that we had into this notation x. There are still some constraints. We know them, but our notation is just going to collapse them for simplicity. So this is called a simulation optimization problem. I have a simulator that has the function embedded inside of it. I can query it at any decision vector value. Right? So I, I determine how much wheat, corn, and beans I want to plant, and then I query it. And then I change that, and then I query it again. But I want to actually optimize this function. Right? I want to find the decision variables that allow me to do well on average. And so simulation optimization is optimizing a nonlinear function, not necessarily linear anymore. We've embedded it, and it's complicated, with uncertainty, it's living inside of a Monte Carlo simulation model. So I develop general algorithms to solve these kinds of problems for different kinds of decision variables. Your decision variables might be, these happen to be integers, right? So if, if you are going, to, oh, sorry, acres. I missed acres. Uh, so if there are acres, this will be a continuous decision variable, potentially, or maybe discrete, depending on how you choose to model it. Uh, you can plant 500 acres, you can plant 550 acres, and so on. Uh, you can divide it up however you want between wheat, corn, and beans. Uh, so if I'm sitting at a decision, a particular decision point, right, how do I know which direction to move to get to one that might be optimal? And optimal in what sense? Optimal in expectation, which is all I can tend to do when I have such randomness. OK, so I develop general algorithms for these kinds of problems. And it has had major impact. So these algorithms have been used by a group at Virginia Tech that solved a vaccine allocation to control an epidemic in all of Seattle, where they modeled at the person level. So they had a network of people, and they said, I have some, some vaccines, but I can't vaccinate everyone. But I have a model uh, of every person in Seattle. Who should I vaccinate to make sure that my expected deaths from the epidemic will be lowest as I can get them over the time horizon? And so this is a huge problem. And we've been able to solve it 
or the people in Virginia Tech have for this kind of, uh, with these kinds of algorithms that we can develop. Another application is brain computer interfaces. So you have some person who is connected through their brain to a prosthetic arm or some other prosthetic robot type uh, limb. And they will think about how they want to move the arm. And you have to take the brain waves from the electrodes and then figure out how they want to move the arm just by reading the brain waves. And so there's been success in doing this as well. A lot of other areas, emergency services, financial modeling and portfolio optimization, manufacturing and supply chain transportation uh, have all seen major impact from simulation optimization and hopefully also planned breeding uh, as we learn to incorporate these techniques. So simulation optimization is a powerful tool and I like to think of it as sitting at the interface of three areas. So optimization is traditionally deterministic. Um, you add in a statistical component and also computer science and you have simulation optimization, which is abbreviated SO sitting right here in the middle. So we pull on ideas from all these disciplines and sit in the, in the interface. And as you may expect, these problems, solving them is difficult, right? We have uncertainty, we may, may or may not have gradients, um, we may not know in which direction to move, so we have to deal with sampling efficiency and proper control of stochastic error are the key aspects of these algorithms. We have been working in this area. The work has been developed for about over 30 years uh, and single objective simulation optimization problems are beginning to have mature algorithms developed for them. Uh, Multi-objective simulation optimization. So for example, if you have two objectives and you want to identify everything that is Pareto optimal, this is just getting started. And so we'll talk some, I actually started working in that area because of the work that we'll talk about today with Ben McCloskey. It turned out that the problem that we had was by objective, and so we had to create new methods to solve that problem. Okay, so now we're in math tutorial land. So now is a good time for questions about simulation optimization. What is it? What do we do? Okay, nothing yet, quite clear, excellent. All right, so now we'll get a little muddier. Uh, so this is a, a brief primer in what's called large deviations theory. Um, and I've written here, if you get lost, we'll, we'll go through it, but if you get lost, the key point is an unlikely event occurs in the most likely of all the unlikely ways. So we're going to be analyzing events that are unlikely, and we want to think about how they might happen, well, the most likely way is how they're going to happen at some level. So that'll be the North Star uh, when we get there. Um, but you deal with things like ordinary deviations all the time. That's the central limit theorem. Right? So the central limit theorem says, if I'm estimating a mean, then uh, my standard error essentially is going down as order one over square root n. Right? And I will converge if I scale my x bar correctly and I have some assumptions satisfied, I'll converge to a normal zero. Uh, it turns out that large deviations is another regime where we're worried about deviations that are larger than you would typically worry about in a central limit regime. And so I deal many times in asymptotics, but as you know by the central limit theorem, even though it's an asymptotic result, it can be extremely useful. Uh, it can, limits can kick in quickly, uh, you can get a lot of guiding principles by doing an asymptotic analysis. So what is large deviations? We know that if we have independent and identically distributed random variables, x1 up to xn, finite variance, you construct the sample mean in the usual way. We know by the strong law of large numbers that that value is converging with probability 1 to the true mean mu. All right, so let's graph this, what's going on. I have a value mu. And now in large deviations theory, I'm going to be concerned about the probability that I observe a sample mean much bigger than some value that I care about A. 
right? So if I take some sample, n1, and I plot the probability density function of the sample mean x bar, for this sample size n1, it might look like this. And if I want the probability that my sample mean is bigger than a, well, I'm just going to integrate under the curve. It's this area. Okay. Uh, so if I take a sample n1, the probability that x bar is bigger than a is this blue part. Now let's increase the sample. If I increase the sample and I have an n2 that's bigger than n1, then my density function gets a little thinner. Remember strong of large numbers, it's converging to a point mass at mu. So I have a little bit less area here. And if I increase it further, it shrinks more. So large deviations theory that we're going to be talking about is saying, at what rate does this area go to zero? Because in the limit, my x bar is converging. So the probability that I observe a large deviation event, that my x bar comes all the way up here and is estimated as bigger than a, is going to zero. And we want to know at what rate is it going to zero as my n tends to infinity. So this picture is helpful for that. As long as I have a light-tailed distribution, right, so my moment generating function is finite, then I have ignored this for a moment. Just look at the bottom. We're saying the probability that my x bar is in some interval a to infinity, so I got that large deviation event and I observed my x bar way out there, is approximately e to the negative n, which is my sample size, times the rate function evaluated at a. So I can move my a around, right? So my a could have been anywhere in here. Let me go back to this picture. If I move my a over here or move it up here, the rate is going to change, right? Because that tail probability is falling differentially depending on where my a is. So I can plot the rate function for all different values of a. And we'll do that on the next slide. But essentially, this is saying, right, so the infimum, this is called the rate function i of x over x and a. The in, anytime you see an infimum, just think minimum. It's the smallest value, uh, is i of a. So now we'll come back up here. We're going to see things that look like this. Negative limit, n goes to infinity, 1 over n log probability x bar in a to infinity. Do the math in your head. Take the log, divide by n, move a negative over get a limit, and you get the i of a popping out the other side. So that's all that is. We're saying, under some conditions, the rate of decay is exponential. And we're going to be talking about optimizing this term as a function of the sample size in, hopefully this will get clearer uh, when we do an example. So it turns out rate functions are non-negative and convex. Convexity is good. We like convex. Um, and they bottom out at zero at the mean, right? So x bar will always be either side of zero, of the mean, right? So the rate there is zero, uh, but it goes up on either side for normal. So imagine the normal probability density function. You have that e to the negative one half x minus mu over sigma squared. That's what's coming down here as your rate function for a normal random variable. So what's going on here? Remember, our, our compass is going to be the unlikely event occurs in the most likely of all the unlikely ways. So my x bar, I'm worried about it being bigger than a. But my x bar can be anywhere. It could be at 3, or it could be at 4, or it could be at 200. But what's the most likely event? x bar is right at a, right? So the most likely way that I'm going to see an x bar bigger than a is to observe x bar at a. All the rest of them are way, way less likely. I think that's enough to be dangerous. Yeah. So it'll make your rate function a different shape. So this is a particularly nice quadratic rate function. For normals, it's symmetric. But if you think of other uh, distributions, you may have a rate function that, that comes down and then goes way up like that, 
or has a different shape or asymmetry. It will still be convex, so having that shape. Uh, it'll still always have the, the bottom, the minimum occurring at the mean with a value zero. So it, the, the rate function form depends on the distribution. Okay, so now you are, you all know about large deviations. Uh, unlikely event occurs in the most likely of all the unlikely ways. So why do we care about this? Why would we be interested in large deviation events in a context where we're estimating things? So let's suppose that we want to pick the parent pair that produces progeny with the largest expected biomass. You may have uh, some problem like this. And we can use Monte Carlo simulation to simulate the breeding and growth of progeny from several parent pairs. And we sample n equals 10 progeny from each of the three parent pairs. And we get box plots that look like this. So remember we're maximizing. So these two are better. One and two are better than three. And so now, if I suppose that one is truly the best, so it, it actually has the highest mean, I don't know it yet. We're interested in the rate of decay of probabilities such as x bar two minus x bar one is in zero to infinity. What does that mean? That would mean that my x bar two, even though it is not the best, is estimated as better than the best one. So this is, I accidentally pick the wrong parent pair as being the best one. And I can control this, the rate of decay of this probability. So one thing that's very interesting that comes out of um, literature called ranking and selection is that ordering is exponentially fast, whereas estimation is slower. Estimation, I can estimate the true mean of this parent pair of the progeny they're producing as order one over square root n. That's my standard error, sigma over square root n. And it's, it's falling much slower than being able to tell which of one or two is better. Which are of one or two is better is happening at an exponential rate. So you can order them faster than you can estimate them when you're doing simulation like this. So the tail probability we're interested in is, for example, x bar two minus x bar one is in zero to infinity, which looks like what we saw before. And notice that I've buried it. We'll expand the notation later. But x bar two, I may have different amount of samples that I spend on parent pair one versus parent pair two in terms of how I breed them, right? I might breed 10 from this one and 30 from this one, right? I, I can do that. That affects the rate of decay, right? So when we come back and we see this in alpha right here in the exponent, this is going to be in scaled by the proportion of sample I give to that parent pair, and it's going to become a decision variable for us. How much sample should I give across these parent pairs so that I can make their ordering happen as fast as possible? Okay. So even though this is, we've gone the route of math, this is fairly intuitive, right? If you got this plot, and you have parent pair one, parent pair two, and parent pair three, parent pair three is pretty bad, and you know it. And then I give you 30 more samples, you're probably not going to give 10, 10, 10. Right? It's parent pair three is already bad. We'd rather differentially sample to figure out who's better between one and two. We've just put some math on that concept, is all we've done. That allows us to analyze it and rigorously say, what is the differential sampling scheme that we want to use? So that is where we're going we'll head back into plant land for a little while. More comfortable. So suppose a farmer wants to grow one extreme individual. This is the problem that Ben had. Uh, he wanted to figure out, given a population of breeding parent pairs, for example, we, we buried the genetic effects just for simplicity. We considered pairs as units on their own. Uh, we have a single growing season. And then the question is, how many progeny should be planted from each parent pair so that we maximize the expected maximum biomass we observe in the field? 
So we're going after that one biggest, tallest, largest plant. And the idea then would be to propagate that into future generations. So again, uh, we'll borrow math. So we're given some breeding budget B, and we want to maximize the expected maximum over all of the parent pairs and all of the children we breed from each parent pair of this random variable, which is my yield. So each child from each parent pair, function of weather, function of whatever happens in the field, uh, we observe this yield. And so we want to maximize the expected maximum we see, subject to that we can only breed so much in total, which is B, and we can choose how much we breed from each parent pair as we go along. So a total of Xi children will be bred from the ith parent pair. Yij of C is the observed trait of the jth child from the ith parent pair. And the uncertainty could be due to anything you have in your model. So genetics, soil conditions, the weather, whatever. Each planting plan is assessed through Monte Carlo simulation. And the granularity of the simulation that we used is that you essentially take a parent pair, simulate it, out pops the child, and so you get one observation from the progeny trait distribution of the parent pair. So that's the unit at which we're simulating. So this problem, evaluating the objective function with high precision may be expensive, because what do I have to do? Let's suppose that I choose to breed equally from all the parent pairs that I have, and that satisfies my budget constraint. Well, that's one potential solution. So I put that in my computer and I say, okay, now tell me what is the maximum of the first replication. So I did one trial and I got a maximum yield. Okay, now I have to do that again. And then I have to do that again. And then I have to do that again, just to get an estimator of this objective function at that particular breeding scheme. And then maybe that didn't do as well as I wanted. Now I have to play with it. These are my decision variables. The X's are what I can decide. And so I have to change it. So our whole problem was how do we make this tractable? How do we actually solve this on a computer in a way that is manageable? Feasible set may be large. You can do a lot of different things. So, Ben was telling me that a lot of his colleagues kept saying, well, you're going to allocate everything to the one best parent pair. There will be one best, and you're going to give the entire breeding budget to that one. And it turns out that this is the correct answer, but only if your trait is Bernoulli. So the trait is there or not there. So something like disease resistance. You're resistant or you're not. And so you will have your YIJ will be Bernoulli P, Bernoulli is like coin tossing. There's some probability of success each time you toss the coin. And so if each parent pair is producing children that are Bernoulli with some value P that depends on the parent pair, then we can prove that the solution is to identify the parent pair with the highest probability of producing that resistant offspring and then give everything to them. So this devolves into what's called a ranking and selection problem because you don't know this probability for each parent pair. You'll use Monte Carlo simulation to try to figure it out. And we're trying to assign everything to that one identified parent pair. So if you're interested in this problem, we do have methods for that. Um, in terms of the operations research audience, we decided to go with a slightly more complicated model. He was worried about traits that are normally distributed. And it turns out that for normally distributed traits, you will not necessarily give everything to one. So let's take an example. Uh, remember the YIJ of C are the traits of the individual children. They're IID normal with mean that depends on the parent pair and variance that depends on the parent pair. So if we have parent pair with normal uh, mu1 is 0, sigma1 is 50, Parent pair two is mu two is 50, sigma two is 0.01, right? So I have one sort of fat distribution that is wide, high variance but low mean. And then I have another distribution that is high mean but low variance. It turns out that I am going to split the allocation across these parents. 
So if I give everything to the low mean distribution here, then it turns out that my expected max is 42, something like that, estimated expected maximum. Uh, we have small standard errors. We had to simulate this, these results. Uh, if we give everything to the second one, then I'm going to hit that high mean, but I'll have, it'll be very near to, to 50. Yeah, question. Good question. So we found, we don't actually have numerics on this in particular, but we found that it's somewhat de dependent on the breeding budget. So this was constructed specifically as a counterexample, so that Ben could say, not for normals, and, and say, we have to do something else. Um, so it depends on what the breeding budget B is. It turns out that if you let your breeding budget get very large, you are going to give all to the high variance parent pair. Um, why is that? So if we look at the, the split allocation that happens to be optimal, we're going to give one to the high mean low variance parent pair. Why? Because we want to secure the high mean. We can give one and get a high mean with pretty good certainty, so we want to give one there. The other two, we're going to go for broke on the high variance parent pair because the high variance parent pair has the potential to produce with higher probability parents out here or children out here in the tail. So I'm going to give one to secure the high mean on the mu2 and then I'm going to give everybody else trying to get that extremum in the tail. And it turns out as your breeding budget gets really big, you will give everybody to the high variance parent pair because you're going for that tail always. It doesn't benefit you to give a lot to the lower mean one or lower standard deviation one. So in terms of how does it actually work out, I can't, I'm not entirely sure, but I can tell you asymptotically where it'll go. Yeah. Often with the data that we had, giving all to one was an optimal strategy, but it wasn't always, yeah. So we are taking parents separately as a pair, right? So it would be this pair produces children with this distribution, and this pair produces children with this distribution. Oh, I see what you're saying. It should also have some of the same So the means will, I mean, you know, like you took the, you get the two best in the population off the map, but it's pretty close to the same as it is. So I think you're talking about how did I get these parent pairs in the first place? So, um, is that right? I mean, actually, I think, you know, this is kind of the, this is kind of the right thing. The high one, the high mean, will have the lower variance, right? Right? And the, the ones that the wider cross will have the greater variance. I think this way, in order to correctly for what we see in the region, right? True, yeah, but I'm saying if, 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 if your budget is infinite, then your solution would be to take your best parent and your very worst parent, right? You're, because you want the highest very well, to get that pair. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> but, but how about, how about, under, how about you unrelated individuals with infinite right, right. with infinite recombination? So if, if you have the ability to control how variable this is, and you have an infinite breeding budget, yeah, you will, you will try to maximize this variance and then allocate everything to it. Yeah. Now that could be a very large breeding budget, uh, <laughs> depending, yeah. Okay, so I hopefully I think I've convinced you that the all-to-one strategy is, is not always optimal, at least, in the normal trade case. There's that other concept, which would be that you want to take that high probability mean 
and just inch it along. And maybe that's the opportunity. I guess I'm just right. In, in terms, yes, if you could change these parent pairs and inch this one further, you'll probably be allocating something to it because it's all of a sudden it's producing your best, even though it's lower variance. Yeah. Um, for, yes, as opposed to multiple traits, we have, yeah, just one trait. That was one extension that Ben brought up that going into multiple traits will complicate everything. You might not have the other traits. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Can you go back to the prior slide on the stochastic options? How you guys observe this? Sorry, the, the one slide we get started. Okay. This so one. If I am getting this right, so rather than choose one uh, roster, you only look at essentially one individual per condition, yeah, or per uh, vector of uh, uh, condition, and then you choose another set. And then you're trying to, it's a massive multi space you're trying to survey. And you can essentially tell the gradient by only looking at a single individual from each one, or do you have to, you don't say that this is like the whole population under a certain condition, is that correct? Right, so we're, we're going to avoid, or attempt to avoid, simulating at least at equal allocation the entire population. Okay. Uh, I, I was kind of worried if you, you know, kind of how we do it in the selection, we don't necessarily need the sample of a given data type twice, as long as we know how everybody else is fully related to them. We can, can you optimize the function even if you have two very related vectors or conditions, you can then figure out what direction to go and only simulate one individual at any one point. Yes, so this right? would be putting some kind of neighborhood structure on the feasible space. A neighborhood structure. Yes, okay, that's, that's, yes. That's so this, we do not have a neighborhood structure. We assume we don't have one. That would be an extension that may help. Uh, so we took a different route uh, of assuming that the parent pairs are not orderable and they don't have neighbors, which may be an oversimplification. Um, but good point. But if there were only uh, if I one model, genetic and some environmental factors, this probably would be a lot of neighborhood. Yes, yes, where you could sample at one and then say, well, uh, I know that the people or the, the plants near me are going to be similar in certain respects. Okay, so this is, this is a tough problem to solve. So we started thinking about how do we, how do we simplify it? Uh, how do we get something that is more tractable? So it turns out that, as you may have guessed from the previous slide, if a parent pair has a mean and variance that is dominated by some other parent pair's mean and variance, you will never simulate, or you will never get any of the breeding budget. You may have to simulate to figure out what the mean and variance are, but you will not allocate anything to it. Right? Because it's neither producing that extreme individual nor going for the variance. So efficient parent pairs, are non-dominated in terms of their mean and their variance, and only parent pairs on the Pareto front will receive a planting budget, non-zero, in the original breeding problem that we talked about. So the goal then is to somehow identify those on the Pareto front. So this is just an example data set that Ben had uh, or created, where the Pareto parent pairs are sitting right here. They're represented by circles. So how do we identify these one, two, three, four, five parent pairs that have the best mean and variance values? And you may then wonder, well, wouldn't it just be the corner points? Wouldn't these ones, the extrema, be the only ones to get allocation? And again, I set my computer running and I have a counterexample for that too. So uh, prove our counterexample is, is the way to go and we have a counterexample. So, you may allocate something, for example, to this one. Um, and so you'd like to identify the entire Pareto front. So what does that give us? It gives us a reduced set to consider. 
So when I'm trying to solve that original problem, I don't need to allocate across 20,000 parent pairs anymore. I only need to consider allocating across something less than or equal to about 25 parent pairs. So this is reducing the dimensionality of the problem dramatically. If you can identify those Pareto parent pairs that are dominated in terms of their mean and their variance. So we propose a two-step solution to solve the mating design problem. So n is a total simulation budget that you can use. We're gonna choose n large and use a simulation to obtain estimators for each parent pair. And we're gonna construct an estimated Pareto set. So we'll call that p hat. That's a function of my simulation budget. And then we're gonna solve an estimated version of the breeding problem. It's we're calling it problem a hat sub p hat of n. Uh, this is just, I've reformulated the expected maximum using the fact that we have normal distributions. So if you don't recognize this, don't worry. It's just a par parametric form. But I don't know the mean and the variance in here for each parent pair, so I'm estimating it. So I'm just using plug-in estimators for all the values that I don't know. And I'm evaluating it only over our estimated Pareto set. So we're going to predetermine the, the estimated mean and variance values in my simulator and get the estimated Pareto set and then solve this problem only on that set. And it turns out that if I let my sample size in my simulation go to infinity, then I will get the true optimal breeding budget allocation plan out of this problem. So the key is going to be simulating enough that we can get these Pareto parent pairs efficiently. So the nice thing about this, we could have done other techniques. We could have done something for an integer ordered space. But the nice thing about this was that if the breeding budget changes, we don't need to re-simulate. So after we run the simulation studies, you can change this B to be anything you want, and it does not affect what happens to my estimated mean and variance values. So that's nice, because if you're still unsure how many resources you have, you can do the simulation in advance and not have to redo it over and over again. The other one that was a benefit, uh, Ben mentioned that the breeders were not amenable to just implementing whatever one solution pops out of the simulator. You need more than one. They'd like to see entire, the entire Pareto front for them would be nice to see what are the good contenders and then allow them to incorporate other knowledge they have that may not be in the model. So you can present to them the entire Pareto front that you've identified and then let them select from among those. So reducing the set of parent pairs only to the Pareto front reduces the complexity. We have this master planting allocation problem, this problem a hat sub p hat, and then created a specialized branch and bound algorithm just for solving this after we've observed the estimated mean and variance values out of the simulator. So you'll simulate and then solve this problem. But now we have a sub-problem, which is how do we find the set of estimated Pareto parent pairs efficiently? And then there's a simulation sub-sub-problem, which is how do we allocate a simulation budget in to find the estimated Pareto set p hat? I changed the notation here. It's no longer a function of n. Um, this is called multi-objective ranking and selection. And this is sort of how I got my start in working in this area, uh, because all of a sudden we need to identify parent pairs that are on a Pareto front. And so this question is the one where the simulation optimization, you know, we, we get excited when we see problems like this. So how can I create my simulation budget allocated to the parent pairs in an efficient way? And remember, this is ordering. Right? I want to get the order right. So if I have a procedure to estimate the Pareto set, n is my total simulation budget, and I'm gonna let n alpha i be the proportion, so alpha is the proportion of the total simulation budget that I give to the ith parent pair for estimating their mean and variance values. And at the end of simulating, I'm gonna return the estimated Pareto set. Right? So now, how can this go wrong? Well, it can go wrong if one of my parent pairs that's actually on the Pareto front 
is misestimated as not being there. That's an ordering issue, just like we talked about in the tutorial. Or if one of the parent pairs that is not in the Pareto front jumps in. Again, an ordering issue. And so I want to find a simulation budget allocation that maximizes the rate of decay of the probability that a parent pair is misclassified. This is a large deviation event that a parent pair is misclassified. And the unlikely event occurs in the most likely of all the unlikely ways. So in order to figure out what this simulation budget allocation should be, we analyze how likely all these events are. So that's where we're headed very briefly. And it gets a little uh, mathy, but I think you can follow. So equal allocation is what they were doing. It's expensive. It's time and money. Uh, ben was running his experiments on Amazon. And so you have to pay for those servers. And if you're just going to brute force equal allocation, um, it can take a while. So can we do something that is a little smarter? So now we are living in the sub-sub problem of allocating the simulation budget to get those Pareto parent pairs. So some notation. In alpha i is the proportion of sample allocated to parent pair i. Uh, we have the estimator of the mean and the estimator of the variance. We're going to assume normality. So now we have the estimator of the variance is chi-squared. So in a lot of the uh, work that exists on these types of problems, everything is assumed to be normal. So we needed special methods that will allow us to use chi-square random variables uh, and account for that in our techniques. And large deviations is particularly suited to doing that. So how do we analyze these events? So we're going to analyze it pretending we know everything and then later we're going to plug in, just like we did when we didn't know what to do in the master breeding problem. We just plugged in a mu hat in place of mu. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to analyze it, pretending we know everything, and then we're going to plug in to figure out how to allocate our simulation budget. So again, how does a misclassification event happen? I can exclude somebody by accident, or I can exclude somebody by accident. The unlikely event occurs in the most likely of all the unlikely ways, so I have to figure out which one is a higher probability event. So in the large deviations framework, we're concerned with the tail probabilities of these random variables, that my y hats change places on the mean objective or that my sigma hats change places on the variance objective. And I'll go a little fast. So it's the minimum of these two rates is the one we care about. We have to analyze them separately. Um, and it's going to come down to a pairwise rate. So it'll be for exclusion. It's the minimum of the pairwise rate that one Pareto excludes another. I won't go in too deeply about each mathematical expression. Um, MCI turned out to be the misclassification by inclusion. We had an issue analyzing this because of dependence. So we had to reformulate it and do some more math. Um, we came up with these things called phantom Pareto parent pairs, where we can write an exclusion, inclusion event like an exclusion event and analyze it the same way. Math, math, math. Uh, here's the rate, okay? So the unlikely event is happening in the most likely of all the unlikely ways, this is MCE, this is MCI, misclassification by inclusion and misclassification by exclusion. And so I'm going to look at every pair and I'm going to say, which one is the most likely one to exclude or include? And between every pair, that is going to determine the entire rate of decay. Now, remember, decision variables in this are alphas. I can decide what proportion I give to each parent pair. So those are my decision variables. So I want to maximize this rate of decay subject to my alphas have to sum to one. I can only give 100% of sample in total. And this is a concave maximization problem in alpha, which we like, which means we can solve it easier. So what if I solve this? Uh, then it turns out I have some constraints. We use a solver. What's going to happen? I have 100 parent pairs here, 
And the optimal simulation budget is calculated as the solution to this problem where my decision variables are alpha, the proportion to allocate to each parent pair in my simulation experiments. So if I do this and I make the size of the circle proportional to the amount of allocation that each parent pair gets, we're going to shift it toward the Pareto front. So before I was doing equal allocation, so this guy gets as much sample as this guy. No, that's not smart. Instead, who's going to potentially be misclassified? Well, these guys are the ones I care about being misclassified. So anybody that's really close to the Pareto front needs to get more because I have to decide, are they in or are they out relative to their whoever's nearby? This guy is bad and I know it, so I don't need to sample very much. So essentially what I'm doing is I have all these pair, pairwise rates of decay of these probabilities of misclassification that can happen. And the alpha is going to equate the rates. The optimal alpha will make sure they go down all at the same rate. Will give me an allocation that looks like this. And so a few more examples of shifting the sample up toward the Pareto front. So Again, we don't know mu and sigma, right? And we need them inside the rate function. It turns out that the rate function, knowing that, is equivalent to knowing the entire distribution, the mean, the variance, everything. So if we don't know that, what will we do? Well, to implement this, we'll take some initial amount from every one. The reason we have to do that is because we don't have the neighborhood structure. We have not assumed that. So we have to get some estimator of how everyone is doing. Then, we update the sample means and sample variances, we update the estimated Pareto set, and we solve an estimated version of the optimal allocation problem to get that simulation allocation for each parent pair. We use that as a sampling distribution from which we take the next delta progeny, and we keep doing this. So we keep updating our optimal allocation as we go and implement it this way. So, for this allocation, it turns out that we do better than our competitor. There's only one competitor in this area. It assumes all normal distributions. I think the, dis the difference that we have from our competitor is that we're actually able to deal with the chi-squared directly. Uh, we didn't go into detail on what's different about that, but the rate function was different. And it turns out that it allows us to do a little better. And so we have some misclassification probabilities that as my simulation budget is going to infinity, our allocation is doing much better at controlling misclassifications. Right? So imagine that you just give equal allocation instead of doing something intelligent. Well, your misclassification after a simulation budget of 10,000 is going to be all the way up here around 2.5% uh, of your systems misclassified. But for the same simulation budget, you could have a rate of misclassification around 1%. So you can actually do much better by pulling down these probabilities. Okay, and so this slide is for the ORI people who don't know how plant breeding works. Uh, so this is essentially saying, what will you do in real life? You want to uh, breed the largest plant. You'll consult with a company like Nature Source Genetics. You'll build a simulation model. Uh, you'll allocate uh, in intelligently. At the end of the algorithm, you'll estimate the Pareto set. You'll estimate the mean and variance values. You'll decide your budget. You can solve the integer program for the master breeding problem off offline with regards to the simulation because you've already done all of your simulating in advance. Um, and then you adjust and you breed in real life, and then you breed the largest king grass plant. So. Uh, I have some, one more slide with questions. You can ask me questions, but these are the questions that I have for you to sort of turn the question section on its head before we have to leave. Uh, so the questions I had relate to what kind of simulation models do you have and what do you use? Um, so there are plant level models like this, but there are also potentially system-wide models clim that incorporate climate. Um, these models can be any level of abstraction. Uh, so you may have things other than individual plant level simulations. 
You can also think of simulators in general. Uh, so a big data set can be a simulator. So if you can't load the entire data set in your memory well, when you're trying to estimate some parameters, it turns out that we have adaptive, gra adaptive stochastic gradient descent methods now uh, that will allow you to load only a part of the data set to determine if the current value of your parameters is good or bad or get a derivative and move to another point without having to load the entire data set. So simulation oracle uh, can be interpreted more broadly than, than a black box, so to speak. Um, what are your decision variables? What values can they take? Is there a neighborhood structure? What are the objective functions? How long can you take to make a decision? Uh, many times in my field, we worry if it takes the algorithm longer than a minute to run. So if you have 30 days, this is incredible, right? We can really do some things. Um, but I, it's my sense that you'll run it for 30 days, but it better be right, right? That you don't want to run it for 30 days and it's still wrong. Um, and what kind of computing resources will the user have access to? Will they be running on a laptop, on a supercomputer, uh, things like that. So as I've talked to people, I've gotten some sense of the answers to these questions, but these are, these are the big ones. And we have maybe a little bit of time for questions for me. Yeah, thank you. So you're looking at the your Fredo front end page where you wanted to invest in more sampling. You went for um, where you had a higher average, and now we have the greater deviation or whatever. Uh, so we're maximizing both. Yeah. Yeah. So you you had one where you I I, I thought I remember you talking about wanting to maximize the the resampling the, the with the error rate by Oh, so this, so yeah. these, yeah, there okay, so the idea, I'm not sure I understood your question, but the idea is it's, it's harder to tell who's on the Pareto front when you're close to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, if I'm over here, it's pretty easy to tell that I'm bad. Um, so I want to allocate more of my simulation budget in the area where it might be good. Okay. Do you all on the front or on one back? Let me just interpret the picture. It looks to me like the circles get big when there are ties, when there's something close to there being a tie. Exactly. So if you have two parent pairs that are producing children with means and variances that are right very close to each other, and you really want to get the best one, you're going to have to spend a lot of sample to figure out which one is the best one. As opposed to ones that are already far apart. And it's, it's small, despite being on the parade front, that's a small circle because it's not really close to anybody else. Exactly. And I guess in Arizona, so it's up the higher sigma. I mean, at what point do you just maybe suspect the quality of the data you're putting in? Because where you have errors is going to boost you that way. Right. So, so, so if, if you didn't, if all the sample didn't, and somebody dropped a pound of grain, you know, <laughs> then, or, or mixed two, or I can do a seeding double through this part of the field, that's, so you're, you're going to have awesome and errors, <laughs> right? And so I guess, so it's trying to figure out how do we have our ways to deal with errors where we're crude ones, where we just, trim off and maybe if it's a skew we just trim it um and then we put it in and do something similar to this but i guess does the simulation ever know which data points might be corrupt so the i think the concise answer is no <laughs> <laughs> that i i view that as sort of a human in the loop um where you would have some knowledge that somebody corrupted this data and now i have to fix it um, everything that I've done so far assumes that the model is correct, the data was collected correctly. Uh, it's hard for an algorithm 
I think, because what's really going on here, um, this is coming out of the simulator. So you would have already collected your data and you would have already hopefully cleaned it and built an as correct simulator as you could get. Um, and so we're assuming that what's coming out of the simulator is at some level, if we keep sampling forever, we'll converge to the truth. So even though that may not be accurate. Yeah, question. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think everybody sort of observed that when you're on a greater frontier, you have more allocation and sample method. So is there a notion of you're spending all your resources trying to make decisions that have a very minimal impact on the outcome? Yes. Is this multi-objective optimization? Is there an area that sort of attempts to address that phenomenon? There is. So um, it's only just now being developed in the multi-objective context. In the single objective context for this same problem, if we just had one objective, there's something called an indifference zone. And the indifference zone is backing up from the best by a certain amount and saying, if these two systems are within, or parent pairs, are within delta, I don't care. Don't worry about detecting that difference. Uh, so there is some work in the multi-objective context. Uh, it's a little more complicated to specify when you're in potentially high dimensions, what that delta would be. Here you could imagine it might be a box. Uh, there is some work on how to allocate so that you don't spend all your budget trying to decide between these two guys. Yeah, so that is definitely an issue. But the key word there is indifferent zone. If you walk around in my community and you talk about indifferent zone, everybody will know what you're talking about. Would that be the same thing as just saying, I want so these are different problems because I may not know how many are in the indifference zone. Right? So if, I, if I'm maximizing and I back up from the maximum, there could be 100 in there versus saying I want the top M designs is what we call it. Yeah, and there is in one objective, there's also a lot of literature on getting the top, we call it top M. Um, in multi-objective, it's brand new, uh, that area. So we don't have those methods yet. So you want to, <coughs> so you want to uh, pre preferentially sample to give this theory a subset, and then you run, run, the, run the second optimization on, on that subset. And exactly. That, why, why would you uh, preferentially, preferentially sample? to solve the optimization, the final optimization problem directly? We could do that. That is one way to go. Um, I think one of the reasons Ben did not favor that, so the question is, we have this optimization problem, this one. Why not just sample to solve this directly? And we could. Uh, the thing that will come out of this, if you do that, is you will get the optimal breeding budget and not really any other information. You'll get the optimal breeding budget, you'll get the value, an estimator for the value of the objective function as well. But in terms of getting a subset of parent pairs that might be competitive, you won't get that. You won't get estimators for the mean and variance values of those parent pairs. And if someone changes the breeding budget, you'll have to redo all the simulation. So you, and, because I enjoy integer ordered problems, this would be fun. Uh, but I think in terms of the specific context that uh, Ben was looking at, doing it this way turned out to work better. So, yeah, but good question. But on the other hand, you have a little more smooth, less, less hard result. So the assumed the way to actually not completely over the outcome, right? So that's less smooth. Instead of, you know, Oh, I, I think I see. So we actually can prove that if we estimate this set correctly, that none of the breeding budget will go to anybody that is outside the Pareto set. Yeah, so that was a condition of reducing the feasible set to this, this value, yeah. But again, you, so that this all assumes your model is correct and that is doing what you want it to do. Because whatever's in this Pareto set is going to depend on your model. So uh, I don't know why we have to vacate the room, but we do have to.
go to lunch. <laughs> so uh, with that in mind, let's thank you again. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.